Okay, we've all heard 40 days and 40 nights. It's where all the conversation lands. But in fact, Noah and his family were in the ark far longer than that. There's going to be math again, but we'll talk about all that stuff on this week's Beyond the Notes. Okay, the other guys on the teaching team have been uh, teasing me because all of my Beyond the Notes podcasts have been real mathy and sciencey this time. And one more time, I'm going to go a little bit of math on you, but I want to show you again the, the elegance and precision of what God is saying in the flood account and also to, to help us understand the duration of the flood was far more than the, the original 40 days and 40 nights, which uh, is is just the first wave of rainfall. I'm going to be in Genesis 7 and a little bit of into, into Genesis 8, actually a good bit into Genesis 8, looking at some specific verses and some specific chronology of the flood. We, um, we have our first date reference for the flood in Genesis 7, verse 11. It says, in the 600th year of Noah's life. So there's our our reference point, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month on the 17th day of the month. Now, generally in the Old Testament, month references, months are referred to as 30-day periods. They they um, they caught up with leap year stuff with a different, a different system than we have. They had 12 30-day months. So in the uh, on the 17th day of the month, that was the day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were open. So day zero, if you will, is the day that the fountains of the deep broke open and the rain began to fall. Remember, rain is coming from two directions. A lot of rain coming down. I mean, pardon me, water is coming from two directions. A lot of rain coming down, but far more water coming up. As that water erupts from underground, the thin layer of Earth's crust that was on top of that water suddenly finds itself unsupported. There's not the water beneath it. The water is all going above it. And that collapsed layer of crust accounts for, and the water settling back into it, those are your ocean basins. So that's the, you know, where did all the water go? The water's all still here. It's in the Earth's oceans that were covered by thin layers of land, by and large, before the flood. Um, that, was a, that was a small rabbit chase. Day zero, the uh, water begins to fall and the water begins to erupt out. That, that 40 days and 40 nights of verse 12 is the same as the 40 days and nights of... Um, actually, it's an additional 40 days pass at verse 17. The flood continued for 40 days on the earth. So we're, we're now into this period of about 80 days. When we get to verse 24, the last verse of chapter 7, and the waters prevailed on the earth for 150 days. That is that we are at a total of 150 days so far. That is not after those earlier 40 days references. That is including those 40 day references. For 150 days, the water is pouring onto the earth, including peaking. The, the peak depth of the water happened late in that 150 days. And now the water is, is such that every living thing is blotted out. The high mountains are, are buried. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits. That's, that's, uh, a uh, depth of about 22, 23 feet above the highest mountains. All of that happens in that first 150 days. We round into chapter 8 now, and we have another uh, time reference. At the end of 150 days, that is, as the 150 days end, verse 3 of chapter 8, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month. That is 74 days after the um, end of the 150 days. <laughs> wow. 150 days in the last verse of chapter 7. Then we get 
to the 10th month and the first day of the 10th month. That puts us at a total of 224 days now until the water begins to have receded noteworthily. And at that time, on the 7th month and the 17th day of the month, we get to the point that the water has begun to peak and recede such that the ark begins to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Now, I'm going to come back and talk about the mountains of Ararat a little bit at the end of this podcast. We'll hold that thought. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month. And in the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. That is day number 224, the additional uh, 74 days after the 150 days mentioned back in the last of chapter 7. So we're already in the ark for 224 days when the ark comes to rest. But the ark coming to rest just means that the water level has begun to recede so that that mountain ranges have begun to emerge. It does not mean that the floodwaters have receded as far as they're going to recede. Forty more days pass, and now we're at the 264th day when the, Noah opens the window of the ark and sends out a raven. And that raven just flies back and forth with no hope of landing. Then he sent forth a dove, verse 8. Now, we don't know how long it was between the raven and the dove, but it's interesting to note down in verse 10, it says he waited another seven days. So most of us would speculate, I would certainly speculate, that it's seven days between that raven and the first dove. If that's the case, the first dove goes out on day 271. Uh, And dove number one goes out on day 271 and can find nowhere to land, just returns to the ark. Seven days later, verse 10 of chapter 8, he sends another dove out on day 278. And that dove comes back with an olive leaf in its mouth. So now we know the water's coming down. But Noah waits another seven days till day 285, and there is no return. Now, if we do the math, we find that 285 days puts us in the 12th month and day two. This has been 12 30-day months and two days since the uh, beginning of the flood. But if we get to verse 13, we see that in the 601st year of what? The 601st year of Noah's life. In the first month, the first day of the month. That is 29 days after the, uh, the, actually 29 days after the seven day waiting period after the dove came back with an olive leaf. Wow. I'll tell you where to find the chart of all this, but when I'm done. On that day, uh, the waters were dried from the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. So in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, that is 56 more days later, while the water is thoroughly receding, which gets us to 370 days total, God said to Noah, go out of the ark. So those guys were in the ark for about a year and 10 days. More than half the time, the ark was actually grounded in a high mountain somewhere, which leads me to my follow-up, a couple of follow-ups. First, the uh, chronology that I've given you is charted in various excellent resources. In the uh, book, Um, Creation to Babel by Ken Ham is where you'll find probably the clearest rendering of that chronology of the flood chart. The other thing I wanted to talk about briefly today is the ark itself. All of my life that I've been old enough to pay any attention, somebody somewhere has claimed to have discovered Noah's ark. There have been various expeditions and various explorations. A couple of things come to mind. First, if you're looking for the mountain or on the for the ark on a particular mountain, Mount Ararat is in Turkey. But the Bible doesn't say the ark rested on Mount Ararat. It said 
on the mountains of Ararat, which is a range of mountains uh, around the Turkish-Armenian border in the eastern, far eastern part of the modern nation of Turkey. But those mountains weren't given that name until about the medieval period. So it might be that not only is that the wrong mountain, Mount Ararat, but it might be the wrong mountain range. The mountains of Ararat may not even be the same mountain range. Now, it might be the same mountain range, and the people in that region have called that mountain range Ararat back for numberless generations. So it may be the right range of mountains. It seems to be well located to be that, but we don't know. And in terms of have we found the ark, the answer is we have not. We have not. Several reasons for that. First, when they came out of the ark and they began to want to build structures, well, they had a massive amount of lumber right there in the boat they didn't need anymore. So I would imagine that the first stage of the destruction of the ark was building things out of wood when there weren't many forests left and a huge supply of wood was sitting right there. Uh, And then thousands of years have passed and wood just doesn't do well in the elements over thousands and thousands of years. We haven't found the ark, and brother and sister, we don't need to. Uh, Make this a clear takeaway from today's podcast, since I've thrown a lot of complexity and a lot of obscurity at you. Christianity is not a faith that is driven by artifacts, objects, and souvenirs. Christianity is not a faith of artifacts. Christianity is a faith of facts. There are bedrock truths upon which our faith rests, not trinkets, toys, and souvenirs. If we had the intact Noah's Ark, you and I would make an idol out of it, just like you know pieces of the true cross or the Shroud of Turin or any number of other the religious doodads. We don't need them to prove the truth of God's word. God's word is true. Your Christianity is a faith of facts, not a faith of artifacts. Don't you forget that. Well, I promise on my next episode of Beyond the Notes, there'll be less math. Meanwhile, thank you for liking, sharing, and bearing with the math here on Beyond the Notes.